Here we are, the day has come. Canon has released the Canon R5C, a absolutely crazy set of features and a very interesting set of disadvantages or weaknesses. And I really do think this is the most significant game-changing camera that Canon has released since the original 5D Mark II. So the number one most significant feature of the R5C is that it is essentially just the R5 with a fan body-wise. So it is still very, very small, smaller than the 5D Mark II and Mark III because it's mirrorless, has all the same function of the R5 with the exclusion of the stabilized sensor. So for just $400 more than the original price of the Canon R5, you're getting a world-class stills camera with wireless connectivity, et cetera, et cetera. But then on top of the camera, there is a little dial that switches from photo to video. And when you switch that dial, the entire menu system changes, the entire feature set of the camera changes from a stills camera to a video camera. It essentially transforms into an 8K C70. It has time code in, it has false color. You're able to load looks into it. It has all the same functionality as a Canon cinema camera. In fact, it has more functionality uh, than the C70 because the sensor is full frame, not super 35. It is 8K, not 4K. It has three different compressions of raw light and it has your uh, CFast card. Just like the C70, it has no limits on recording times, even on the 8K raw up to 60p. So you can do slow-mo 8K raw on this camera with a limitation we'll get into later. The big market for this camera is gonna be photographers who want to upgrade their stills camera and move into video. They no longer have to pick between a cinema camera and a stills camera. The R5C is both and does both incredibly well. There is nothing else that I know of on the market right now that does this. The R5 also shares its powered hot shoe with the R3. So you're able to add the Tascam dual XLR imports, if you need XLR audio, and anything else that's coming up like uh, inbuilt wireless video mics. R5 hot shoe can pass data and power, so you don't need to plug those things in. They're gonna connect directly with the camera. Like I said, the camera has full raw light, half raw light, and quarter raw light propping in on the sensor. It also has XF-AVC, H.265, and H.264. It goes up to 120p in full frame on that XF-AVC, and up to 60p, 8K, uh, in the raw. You can dual record to both cards simultaneously in different formats, so you can record RAW to the CFast and some flavor of XFAVC or a proxy, smaller proxy file, MP4, uh, to the SD card. And I really do think that this camera is gonna be a game changer because it's gonna bring so many more people into the Canon video uh, ecosystem because you're able to upgrade a, into a, still, a world-class stills camera and get the video functionality essentially for free. So what are the disadvantages, weaknesses, uh, cripple hammer action on this camera? Well, the biggest one that was talked about is the power limitations. Now, you can shoot 8K up to 30P raw, but once you go above 30P to 50P and 60P, the recording of the raw consumes the entire wattage of the battery, leaving none for the lens to do um, autofocus or change aperture. So if you want to shoot 60p raw, 8k, you will need to either use a cine lens where you adjust that manually, or you'll need to use external power. So either plug the camera into the wall or use either a power brick, like you would charge a laptop off, or a V-mount battery through a combination. If this camera has an Achilles heel, I would definitely say it's the power because it doesn't use the BP batteries, it uses the LP batteries, the small internal batteries um, of Canon's stealth cameras. And if you wanna shoot all day, you'll need a power solution, like you'll need a dummy battery to a DTAP, or you'll need to bring a dozen of these things. Or you will need to get the dual battery power pack that allows you to put two in at once. The two batteries together somehow give more than double the runtime. Another disadvantage of this camera is it doesn't have C-Log 2, it only has C-Log 3. This is to kind of keep a little something, I think, for the uh, C70 with its wider dynamic range. But to be honest, I shoot most of the time in C-Log 3 on the C70 and even the uh, C500 Mark II because C-Log C 2 does have the widest dynamic range, but it doesn't have the 
but those lowest stops aren't that usable. They're usually so grainy that you end up crushing them in post anyway to black. There's not that much usable information. For instance, you know, this information down here, right? If I'm shooting in C-Log 2, if I shot in C-Log 3, you could probably see a little bit more detail in here, but do you really need to? Why would you want to? C-Log 3, called the Goldie Log, is usually plenty of dynamic range, and it has the cleanest image that needs the least cleaning up. So I don't see this as a big disadvantage. I actually see it as an advantage. For the first time, we're gonna get some different variations of RAW, different sizes of RAW, typically on the, uh, C200, C300 Mark III, and C500 Mark II, to shoot RAW meant only shooting at the maximum resolution of the camera, whether you wanted to or not. With the R5C, you're gonna be able to crop in on the sensor to get smaller RAW packages and a, a tighter framing. You can also do different variations of RAW, a uh, high bit, medium bit, and low bit RAW. On the highest bit RAW, on a 512 CFast card, you're gonna get about 24 minutes. And on the lowest bit of RAW on the same card, you're gonna get uh, over an hour, which makes RAW a really attractive format to record in because you have more color depth, uh, you have more versatility in post, able to change the color temperature. You have less compression, so you can sharpen more in post. And with Apple's new M1 chip, you should have a lot less trouble uh, manipulating the RAW on the new Macs. So how do I think this camera is going to change uh, the film industry? For a long time, cinema cameras have been getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. RED released their Komodo. Uh, Sony have a bunch of like the FX6 and FX9, very affordable, um, sub $10,000 cinema cameras. Canon with their C70 had a sub $6,000 cinema camera. And it's not as though cinema cameras could get that much cheaper. We're not gonna see a $1,000 or a $2,000 cinema camera. What the R5C has done is basically give you a $4,000 stills camera that you get a fully featured cinema camera for free with, or for an extra 400 bucks. You're basically getting a cinema camera with all the cinema features, like I said, time code, false color, dual slot recording, different types of RAW settings, all for the same price as a stills camera, which you're probably buying anyway if you're a photographer. I think this camera is gonna make filmmaking that much more accessible to people out there with ideas, which is what I think everyone has been asking for. That is my wrap up of the new R5C features. Um, I'm gonna get my hands on one as soon as physically possible, and I'll do as many tests and comparisons as I can. Also be checking out the new C70 RAW upgrade and how that is gonna compare, especially with the speed booster to the uh, full frame R5C footage. If you're a filmmaker or you're interested in becoming one, definitely check out canonmasterclass.com. I have a ton of video tutorials on that website, including in-depth camera masterclasses for all of the cinema cameras discussed here, and there'll be a R5C masterclass coming as soon as I can get my hands on a camera. It is gonna be a pretty interesting learning curve um, if you haven't shot cinema before, because this camera has both all the R5 uh, photographic menus and then all the C70 cinema menus. Uh, so it's gonna be something that you probably uh, wanna get some training with. Also have videos on lighting, on audio, on gear management, on social media, all the things you need to be a successful filmmaker in 2022. Thank you very much for watching. I will see you next time.